And this is Life on Earth with Robert and Amy Nacer, and not just the two of us. Welcome to Life on Earth. This is going to be a great one. First of all, happy St. Patrick's Day. I hope you all got lucky out there <laughs> and enjoyed your holiday. I was preparing the notes for this show. I had something great to present to you, and Amy said, no, 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 no. We have <laughs> got to talk to Don Watkins. Find out when Don's available. Contact Don. He's like, yeah. Yeah, I can do it. I can do it this Thursday. I'm like, oh, okay. I'll take my notes, throw them out. We're going to talk to Don Watkins. And I'll tell you why. If you've been listening to Five Minutes with Robert Naser or Life on Earth with Robert and Amy Naser, you know we've done shows on the topic of allies. Now, a little more touchy feely in the objectivist space, we talk more about you should treat your allies better than you treat your adversaries. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to be prone to a little bit of infighting. And I don't mean schisms, I mean just even with our friends. Oh, well, you're wrong about this and you're right about that. And like, oh, maybe we should save some of that venom for our opposition. Yeah, but it, it's more like, uh, I want you to agree, agree with me right now because I want commiseration, darn it, because I'm angry. Yes. That's, yeah. <laughs> but for all those discussions, again, in the personal sphere, we didn't talk much about choosing alliances, nor how to remain objective, independent, you know, first-handed, and reality based in this context. So today we make up for that. Today we make up for that shortcoming by talking to a man, the man who has a better handle on this than most of us, certainly better than me. We welcome author, advocate, ARC UK's effective communications guru, Don Watkins to Life on Earth. Don, how are you doing this evening? Really well. Great to see you guys. It's it's funny. I, w w we live near each other and thankfully get to see each other personally. So it's a little bit weird to talk to you guys uh, via Zoom, but uh, be that as it may, I'm really looking forward to it. Yes, we could, it be, is. We could be in China right now or Australia, actually. Well, we had a rehearsal <laughs> for the format because not only is Don going to talk to the, us this evening about intellectual alliances, but as a published fiction author, the last time we talked to you was on Zoom as, as author mm -hmm. of I Am Justice. We that may mention true. that again at the end here. Anybody who hasn't ordered the book yet, not only can you get it for $9.99 on Amazon, but right now it's 99 cents on Kindle. We'll talk about that. But first, your essay, this essay, How to Choose a Cognitive Subculture, which sounds a little elevated and maybe very intellectual, but then the subtitle is A Guide for Non-Cranks, and that brings it right <laughs> home. You don't know, be a crank. Don't be a, well, <laughs> yeah. You open the essay with, to whatever extent you value political liberty, you face a certain tension. You have to defend exercises of freedom that you think are wrong, distasteful, even immoral. Unquote. Now, that seems clear enough to those of us who've debated legalized drugs or prostitution or sexually explicit material or or way back when assisted suicide was an issue. It seems that some people, even decent people within the circles that we travel, when confronted with a new or mixed case, such as vaccinations during a viral outbreak, <laughs> and rather than focus on reasonable evidence, we don't trust any of that. And rather than relying on rational methods, we jump to a side. Well, mm -hmm. our side believes this, and that's what I'm on board with. So your essay included a graphic of a hot topic at the time. This was February 13th, the Canadian truckers protest. So in the context of your essay, what was your judgment of the protests at the time? What did you think of all that? Well, one thing I'll say at the beginning is that this is something that I've been thinking about a lot longer than that. So I'm very interested in movements and in particular because I'm part of one. And so I remember when I was a teenager, there was a objectivist meetup group in the D.C. area. And I would later find out like it was associated with like David Kelly and people uh, like that. But it was a heavy libertarian um, presence. And I remember even though I couldn't exactly articulate why being really weirded out by some of the people like some of the people every week would come in talking about like the branch davidian um uh, massacre and everything like this which had been like a couple years in the past but like they they would it had a real kind of like weirdness and conspiratorial feel to it and i remember thinking like 
if this is the movement, I don't want any part of it. And thankfully, it turns out that that's not the movement, at least not the movement uh, amongst objectivists that I respect and uh, am allied with, you want to put it that way. Now, when it came to kind of this writing this essay, it, it was spawned by some of what was happening with the Trugger protest. But I personally don't have strong views, or let's put it more exactly, I don't have very informed views of the Trucker protest. That is, I think um, it's somewhat complicated, but, it, and I mean, that's illustrated by the fact that people, you know, like Leonard Peikoff take one sort of view that's very different from other um, objectivists I admire. So I don't necessarily want to weigh in on that, but what was what did jump out at me in the to the extent that I did follow it was that some and some of the leaders of it were not just anti-vaccine mandate, but anti-vax. Yes. Which I don't regard as a reputable position. And certainly it's not one that I would want my leadership to blur the, the line between. So the, uh, the, this idea that we kind of objectivism is very big in the distinction between the fact that something should be legal doesn't entail that it's moral. And when you blur that distinction, it leads to all sorts of bad consequences. And just at the persuasive level, you're going to lose all the people who might be persuaded that, yes, you should be free to do this thing, but I don't think it's moral. So I think there's a big difference between somebody who says like, yes, uh, you should like it should be legal to be a prostitute and somebody says you know what there's no moral distinction between the person who um has sex with people based on deep values and admiration and somebody who's like hey i'm trying to you know make six figures quit right like right. and um and so what i was really reacting to was the kind of anti-vax wing of the trucker protest, not not the protest per se, because I think what I have to say should appeal to people um, on both sides of that issue within objectivism. Excellent. It, it makes me think of the expression, I, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And some folks don't want to accept that I know something, but I don't know everything. Well, and that's one of the big points that we're going to, I think, elaborate on as we go. So when I talk about a cognitive subculture, part of it is being really honest with yourself and with others about like what I know and what I don't know. So like, you know, from a, within our little subculture, I'm pretty well known. And so there can be a kind of in, um, a certain pressure that you can put on yourself to think, oh, well, I have to have a view and I have to be able to like explain this is the right way to think about it. But the fact is, there's a lot of stuff I don't like in order for me to have an informed view on this issue. Not only would I have to gather a lot of facts, but I'd really have to process a lot of questions about like when are protests legitimate? When is it legitimate for a protest um, to violate the law? And how does that apply in this particular case? Like there's all those kinds of questions. And I didn't do the work and I had reasons why I didn't do the work. I had, I had other priorities, including the ones that people were paying me to deal with. Um, but I knew that that's the work that would be involved. And so I think part of a healthy cognitive subculture is really striving to be objective about this is what I know, this is what I don't know. And I'm perfectly fine to say, I don't know. Right. Yeah, I, I remember when the trucker, the, the Freedom Convoy issue came out and some of my, my friends um, who, who eventually, you know, got through thinking together on it, they were very impatient. And so when I approached them with, you know, I'm not entirely sure about this, I need some time to think this over. And I think that there's more to this than what we're seeing right now, or what meets the eye or what you might be experiencing. Um, I get <laughs> a lot of angry uh, looks. <laughs> And I just have to say, you know, listen, I, I need some time to think this over. I'm sorry. I can't commiserate with you right now. And uh, I, I wish I could, but I can't. Thank you. <laughs> so. Yeah. I would love to think that at least advocates of objectivism wouldn't be prone to picking sides. Um, but I've, I've seen this so much where people will find the experts on their side and because their side is right, our side is right, we're right about philosophy. 
Therefore, our experts' opinions carry that same weight. And I don't want to use any names to pick specific, specific examples because I don't want to <clears throat> make it sound like I'm criticizing anybody. The point is that you know, if Don Watkins does take the time to examine the evidence on the truckers debate and says, you know, <clears throat> by and large, the truckers are heroes in this and they should be supported. It would still be a mistake for me to say, <clears throat> oh, good. One of our experts has put the truth out there. And it's so much easier. Be again, not blindly following Don. Not that that's a bad idea. But, but because he is a leader within our movement and our movement is right, therefore his opinion becomes evidence yeah and i mean i think thankfully it's a little less of an issue than it used to be you know when the movement was very small like if you had a phd in economics you were an objectivist economist like never mind like are you actually getting economics right well it's well you're an objectivist so like you're you know you're you're our guy and i mean thankfully as the ranks have expanded and as i think um we've become more sensitive to these kinds of issues I think that that's less of a tendency now, but yeah, it still happens. And I don't think like, look, it shouldn't be surprising. Like it would be surprising if that didn't happen because objectivism is made up of human beings. It's made of people of varying levels of knowledge and various levels of fastidiousness of applying it. And so like, to me, it's not surprising that we have these kinds of issues. Like just because I think the philosophy mitigates against it, it's more um, how do we get better at, at dealing with them rather than kind of say, oh, this shouldn't happen. I mean, it shouldn't in the sense that like it's a bad methodology and it's bad. It can be bad ethically, um, but it's normal. Like the default way of functioning is it, uh, looking for shortcuts to knowledge, um, making hasty generalizations, like picking sides based on affiliation rather than thoroughly processing an issue. Like all of that is completely normal stuff that happens in every movement, including good movements. And so we, we just want to become aware of it and try to get better at dealing with it. Now I should say there are some people who should know better. So I have a very different judgment <laughs> of like a person who, you know, is running a business um, and like attends a conference every now and then and maybe jumps on Facebook or Twitter from time to time. I have a very different judgment of them than a professional intellectual. Like professional intellectual should know better. And um, there's a whole, you know, gradient of places in between. You know, if you've studied for 30 years and maybe you're not a professional intellectual, but like, you know, you're spending two hours a day online arguing about things, you should probably know better in most of these cases. Um, but nevertheless, it's still just a normal, normal part of a movement. And our goal can't be to like eliminate it um it's just how can we better try to encourage an approach that actually fosters knowledge yes right and and you know one of, one of my questions that you haven't seen yet is uh um you know when i when i think about this i always think about i always kind of turn it back on to how am i making sure that i am not falling into this uh this anti-conceptual mentality you know, this, this impatience or this following of other people because of peer pressure or however, or this um, anti-mainstream, you know, uh, you know, if the, if the Democrats uh, drink dihydrogen monoxide, then it must be bad, you know, kind of thing. So, you know, introspectively, I try to come up with the words for myself to, to ask myself, am I falling into this? And I, so, so I think in terms of like, you know, when, when did I use to do this? When did I actually fall into these kinds of epistemological errors or, or failures of actually going more forward in my thinking and asking why and how, and is this right? And could this be wrong? Um, you know, I remember in my twenties, yeah. <laughs> my Were 20s, you a little I, more prone to that? Yeah, I don't want to go back to my 20s. Um, I really, I, I fell into the all sorts of traps of, of, of being very impatient, wanting the right answers right away, even if I haven't actually thought thought them through entirely, um, even being resentful, feeling resentful at the fact that I had to think more than my opponents were thinking, you know, <laughs> it's, it's really silly. Um, but, uh, you know, those are actual feelings that I felt. And, and those are the actual evaluations that I had, um, because I really wasn't 
uh, as practiced as I am now in terms of making sure that I'm being as objective as I possibly can be. So, you know, in terms of trying to figure out how to keep people from doing this, you might put yourself in those people's positions. Yeah. I mean, and I think you said like the way that you put it is really important um, in that it's, you're searching for it in yourself. And the way I think about it is like confirmation bias is not something that like, um, it's something you have to actively root out. So you have to assume that you're going to fall into that trap of confirmation bias if you're not actively pushing against it versus, well, no, I know I'm a good thinker. I'm committed to reason. And like, this is the rational view, but at the same time, and this is what makes it difficult for many issues, you're going to have a knee jerk reaction and it is very damaging. And this actually is something that a trap that good people fall into, particularly intellectuals is you start to become so suspicious of your own reactions that you push them aside and what happens is you start floundering as a thinker because there's nothing to orient you. Because what typically happens is you have a knee-jerk reaction and then you try to untangle. Why does like this seem right? And what it, what it amounts to is like um, what people often describe as common sense. So let me just concretize this a little bit because in personal disputes that have come up like within the movement, I remember um, that like my wife and uh, people like that, like, I would just be so confused about who's right and who's wrong and what's going on here. And she would just have like a common sense reaction to it. And inevitably it would cut through a whole bunch of extraneous things and get to the heart of the matter. And I realized that um, I was kind of cutting myself off from that common sense. Like how would I just react to this? Like without, you know, running it through the complicated rate. So you want to take seriously your knee jerk reactions, mm -hmm. but um you don't want that to be the end of the process. And you certainly don't want it to be then looking for things that back up that initial view. It's you take it seriously, you try to understand it. You use that as kind of a guide for clarity because th that knee-jerk reaction is your whole context of knowledge, or, or let's put it, uh, a significant part of your context of knowledge that's coming to bear on an issue and helping you kind of zero in on what's essential here and what's non-essential. But you have to push past that as well. So it's that part of why this isn't easy is that it's not like, oh, here's the you know five questions to ask yourself in every situation to solve all your problems. Well, if we can't have that, <laughs> I, I do find the the tip. I ask myself, well, what would I think about this if I was not, not just if I was not an objectivist, but just if I was an ordinary person, just an average guy in the street, somebody reasonably intelligent. You, you know, in, in in personal development, you know, I often use modeling, and I'll model myself. You know, what would what would me on my own best day, or having developed this skill already, what would I be doing? But sometimes it's more useful to say, no, what would me as just an average Joe think about this? You know, we have a, a Joe lunch bucket exercise we do as part of Great Lakes Objectivists, where precisely we'll do concepts in a hat, except. When we pull the concepts out, we're not doing where we relate them. We're doing, how would you explain this to somebody who's non-philosophical and you're not a fire-breathing objectivist. You're just trying to get him to understand this idea because he wants to know. And uh, taking that perspective of, so if I'm not already on a side in this issue, whatever the issue is, and I'm not a uh, fire-breathing objectivist on the issue, just all I care about is, is, is what is so, what's the reality out yeah, there? And, and another, another thing that we use to make sure that we try to be as objective as possible is to try to find the high hanging fruit, the best argument of the opposition. Uh, steel manning. Yeah. Steel manning. Yes. I call it high hanging fruit. <laughs> yes. Well, steel manning is a relatively new idea. It's the opposite of the old idea of straw manning. Mm -hmm. Instead of making your opposition something easy to knock down, you say, no, what? If he had the best argument in the world, what would it be? What's the best I can present yeah, what, what his is, case? As you say, Don, what, what is your, um, what's, what's the word? Uh, sorry. What's your, what's your unfair advantage? Yes. What is your uh, unfair what is, advantage? What, what is, is the unfair, unfair advantage? Yeah. What would their unfair advantage be if they had right. one? Right. We'll get to that in a minute, but I have to say in the super chat, super chats, chats on YouTube, 
put a couple dollars on it, it goes to the Ayn Rand Center UK. We are on the ARC UK channel. We've got a big conference coming up in a week and a half. So anything you do to contribute ARC UK through Super Chat is awesome. Allison asks an interesting question that might, we might not want to answer it right away. We may want to answer it as we go here because um, I can think how a lot of what you wrote and a lot of what we've discussed applies. She says, I might be misunderstanding Don and I apologize if so. Do you consider not getting a vax immoral? I don't see how unless pushing anti-vaccination propaganda. So what would you say about somebody who says, yeah, I'm not out there being anti-vax. I'm not trying to tell nobody, but I'm not going to get vaccinated. I'd have to know why. Yes. I'm suspicious of it um, just based on my knowledge of the vaccines, but it's not, it, there is a level of contextual, like it, that it's contextual and depends on a person's specific knowledge and circumstances. Um, so I'm not completely agnostic about it. Like, oh, that's the same as like saying, I don't like chicken or I don't like beef. Like it's something I'm suspicious of, but it's not like there's, you know, some commandment thou shall get vaxxed. Like, it, 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 you know, there's some considerations that go into it. Yeah, that was yeah. the first thing that jumped out is me is I'm not so much interested in that you didn't get vaccinated, but why you didn't get vaccinated. Yeah, and, yeah, and in uh, general, that's going to be like a, so like I said, we don't have a list of five questions, but a really good one is usually like, why? Um, particularly if you're talking about judging some person or concrete or some choice is like, I mean, if you think about the objectivist ethics, it's fundamentally about rationality. And so it's not about any particular concrete choice, but the kind of how you make it. Now, um, there's more to say about that. Um, that fundamentally the issue is, are you being rational? Not, did you do this particular thing? And you can't know that in some cases you can know it directly from the nature of the action. And that, I mean, this is part, this is part of what Leonard Peikoff talks about in his article, Fact and Value. It's that um, you can learn a lot about a person's methodology by the particular choices they make in terms of the content of those choices, the ideas that they accept, but that ultimately it has to be rooted in the kind of mental process that led to it. And so for something like vaccination, it's not like embracing Nazism. <laughs> so it's not inherently dishonest. So you have to know the why and be open that, okay, yeah, those are legitimate considerations. Or even I might disagree with the consideration, what they did with the considerations, but they were, my view is that they were honest and making like, you know, a reasonable error. So all of that goes into a judgment of a person or a choice. Excellent. Yeah. Outstanding. In that regard, in the show notes that I've posted online at Facebook, link on Twitter, uh, the Ayn Rand Institute's new ideal discussion about the assault on expertise, I thought was particularly good in that regard. So if folks have questions about that afterward, you might give that one a listen. Um, you write about the danger of agreement. The danger of agreement. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a pretty clear idea. There's a real risk of second-handedness, of not thinking issues through for yourself. And then you're right. You can get caught in an echo chamber where you don't question your views and you start to think that some of your lousy arguments are really strong. <laughs> that, that resonated with me because I've caught myself once or twice thinking, wow, what I just said I really didn't back that up. Or in the worst case, I don't even have any backing for that. Oh, yeah. And I mean, you have to think like, you know, I spent 11 years writing about objectivism at the Ayn Rand Institute. And like, that was a real issue that I had to contend with, which is I'm trying to persuade non-objectivists. And now, thankfully, I worked with people who are very cognizant of this issue and really good at devil's advocate and things. But um, it's super easy for us to think be, for, it's it's hard to be hard on an argument that you agree with. Like you have to cultivate that skill. And it's very easy to think, well, I like this conclusion, therefore I like the argument. And one of the things like, I even think like this is an important thing to do with Ayn Rand. You might think, well, she's right about this, but is this really an, a good argument? 
and you have to be open to the fact of, well, may, I, I think maybe it's on the right track or it's like needs to be fleshed out more or something like that. But having this distinction between, all right, um, a conclusion that I think is true or that I think is probably true, and then the quality of the reasoning that led to it. And the more that you're surrounded by people who share your conclusions, the tendency is that there's not real attentiveness and you're not necessarily as hard on the argument as you are when you're in a context where you disagree with people. And let me just give you like one specific example. There's a really, a really good book by um, Julia. I'm trying to uh, Galif or Galif. Yeah. Julia Galif called the, the scout, scout mindset. mindset. Excellent. And, and it really is a fantastic book and it, it's very relevant to the set of issues we're talking about, but she makes the point that um, she was writing about the I mean, she's writing about how do you cope with confirmation bias and she notes that she heard a study that um contradicted one of her theses that that her central theses that self-honesty is crucial to success and this one said oh self-deception helps you be more successful and she's like oh i'm sure that there's problems with this and she looked at the paper's methodology and sure enough she spotted some flaws with it but then she stopped and asked herself well wait a minute would i have done this if the conclusion had supported my view or would i have said i need to find a place for this in my book and she realized that no if a study was supporting her conclusion she wouldn't have been as critical. And so she went back, she examined, you know, under a fine tooth comb with that, like it, what if I disagreed with this, all the studies she cited in the book and said, I had to throw most of them out because they, I wouldn't have allowed this if it contradicted what I believed. And I think that's really what I, uh, I'm arguing for is you want to be, um, you want to hold the, yourself to the same standard that you would hold things you disagree with. And you want to hold people who agree with you to the same standards of things you disagree with, because that's what it means to be interested in what's true. Outstanding. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you describe the end of having a group that you agree with here. You're right. So here's the pattern. You reject the mainstream on an important issue. Let's stipulate for good reasons. You join a subculture that agrees with you, but this subculture is filled with people who are attracted to the subculture simply because it's outside the mainstream. They feel alienated from and want to feel superior to the larger culture. These people inject crank ideas into the subculture until they're normalized and you end up as a crank. Is that something that you saw specifically in regard to the recent issues or or this it just seems to me this goes back to pretty much the last five years now mm-hmm. since 2016. And I don't mean this as a rag on Donald Trump, but the kind of subcultures that arose out of that, you know, reading the things that Candace Owens has been saying, for example, recently, she still thinks the moon landing was a hoax. She thinks anything the government tells us is a hoax. And this is somebody pretty mainstream on the right in terms of popularity, at least. I'm not too sure what the question is. My, my first question was, is some of objectivism's bad reputation among academics, therefore our own fault? Have we done that in some way? In fact, maybe, maybe I should clarify. I don't mean to make a direct connection, but we just got another super chat from the Shadow Blade. And he says, what is the best way to pick your battles, especially on social media? I have a bad habit of trying to fight everything I think I could win. Uh, well, remind me that we'll come back to that in just a second, but I mean, just to make one or two points on the, what you raised before, I mean, the simple answer is it's like, as long as I've been watching movements, which has, you know, been uh, 25 years. I mean, it's, I think it happens in every movement, every subculture and every intellectual subculture. And that's the whole point I'm driving at is that like, um, now, I, I'm focused in, in that quote on uh, cultures outside the mainstream, where it's rejecting the mainstream. And uh, this is a point Leonard Peikoff has made, and uh, Ankar Gatte often echoes that. And I think I quote it in the piece or, f- or kind of uh, it, you know, hint at it, which is that a, some, a, a subculture outside the mainstream attracts people better and worse than the mainstream. Um, assuming that it's a true view, if it's just, you know, 
if you're a Marxist in 1870, like that, <laughs> that's bad. Like you're, you're probably not getting people better than the mainstream, but in any case, the, I think it, you, when you combine, when you have a subculture that ha- attracts good people for good reasons, and yet it brings in bad people who inject bad ideas. If that is not policed, and I don't mean like, you know, some authority who's walking around going, no, you're out of the movement, you're out of the movement. But I mean, policed by the better people in the movement saying, no, you, like that is wrong. It's uh, and it's really wrong and it's bad methodology and like taking seriously that sort of thing. Um, then it tends to proliferate and it starts to seem like common sense to most people, particularly, again, the ones who aren't in uh, the date, the, the people who are mo- honest people who are uh, most vulnerable to it are the ones who are kind of not centrally in the movement. Like, you know, they just kind of will read stuff on social media and like peruse this or that. Um, and, you know, they start hearing that kind of thing a lot. No, oh, yeah, that makes sense. So, I mean, I see it everywhere. I, it happens in objectivism. It's not distinctive uh, to objectivism, um, but objectivism can do better than that. And that's part of what I was trying to draw attention to is, well, how do you do better than that? And that will get us, I think, ultimately a solution. But to go to the Super Chats question, which remind me uh, what it was. Yeah, he says, what is the best way to pick your battles, especially on social media? I have a bad habit of trying to fight everything I think I could win. It's, it's an interesting question, this pick your battles idea. Are you using that as a way to get out of advocating? Or is it just at some point you can't fight everything? I mean, it's, you know, so we've talked about one question is ask why. Here's question number two on our list of five that we may actually get up to. We'll see. Um, which is what's my purpose? Like that is always almost always going to be a fruitful question to ask and like, all right, is this purpose legitimate? And if it is legitimate, it's going to set the standard by how much time and what context I'll devote to something. Um, It certainly like, look, in the end, whatever a kind of non-professional does on the side is not going to have like a fundamental impact on the state of the world. So this idea that like, if I don't go out there and kind of set everybody straight, um, my ideas are going to lose out. Like it's just, it's just not true. Now that doesn't mean you can't have an impact, but it does mean like, it's a very different context for, I can kind of have an impact at the margins and that's really valuable. Uh, and it's certainly valuable for me feeling like I'm efficacious in the world and promoting my values. And like, I mean, imagine if, you know, in a science fiction scenario, like your decision or your actions are going to, you know, uh, you're the chosen one. And if you don't live up to it, like, you know, the world will collapse. All right, well then you better, you better go out of your way to live up to it. So it's, it's all dependent on your individual purpose. And the reason I stress that idea of like, don't put too much weight on it in terms of its practical impact in the world was to say, like, if you're doing it because it's important for me to put some time into promoting my values, it's a fun way to clarify my thinking. It's, um, it, it is a way of me testing to make sure that my arguments are as strong as I think they are and not fall into that kind of um, uh, confirmation bias we've been talking about. Like all those can be fine reasons, but you'll notice that that then puts a cap on it. If, if my goal is just to make sure that like I've steel man my thinking, then I don't need to like beat this guy into submission. I might have an exchange back once or twice and see like push, see, all right, what's the argument against my argument? Yeah, that's not very good. And then once they're not making new arguments and it's devolving into um, hostility and everything, then I can just leave it aside. And I don't feel like, oh, he got the best of me or something. It's like, no, I got what I wanted to get out of it. I got to test my arguments. And, you know, see um, how they went. I mean, my basic rule is with very, very few exceptions, I'm never going to have an exchange, um, an argument online that goes back and forth more than twice. And that's because, like, arguing on arguments don't move the needle. Like, even if we're thinking about, like, you're the best persuader on earth, arguing on Twitter 
because people will other people only follow the back and forth maybe at two or three levels unless they have their own issues and they get kind of really obsessed with something. So you're just not making any kind of impact. It's all between you and the person you're arguing against. And it tends then to be very much, there's some psychological need that you're trying to fill. Like I need to feel like I came out the victor. Or I need to prove that I really know what I'm talking about. And you should be suspicious of yourself in those kinds of scenarios. But I mean, if, if it's pure fun, then I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but it, this questioner doesn't seem to be saying, hey, I'm having a ball of a time and I know it's a wise use of my time. Is there something wrong with it? Uh, I'd say, you know, if, if you're using your time wisely and enjoying it, then, you know, more power to you. But yeah, I mean, there's way more upside for like, you know, it, for most people, if, if really, so, so there's a movement, which is, as you can imagine, a problematic movement called the effective altruism movement. And their view is, we need to really think scientifically and with precision and measurability, what will have the highest, most cost-effective impact in terms of benefiting the most people in the biggest way, right? And so, you know, buying mosquito nets turns out to be way more impactful at saving lives than like, you know, donating to this or that charity, whatever the case may be. Set aside the effective altruism movement. But if you're thinking about persuasion reasonably, the fact is for most people, you'll have better impact in the world if you get like a side job, earn the extra money and use it to like hand out copies of Atlas Shrugged or the moral case for fossil fuels or donate to ARC UK or whatever. Like that's your leverage for most people. That And so um, that's, yeah. it, you should just really be easy on yourself in terms of what, you know, what yeah. you're trying to get out of arguing. Right. One thing I would never have thought of is how would you apply the effectiveness model that effective altruism <laughs> uses to effective objectivism advocacy? But, well, I'm not but, even necessarily saying that you should because we're, uh, we're egoists. So part of it is yeah. how do you enjoy promoting your mm -hmm. ideas? Right. And if you don't want to like deliver pizzas in order to give copies of Atlas Shrugged out, then you should do it even if that were more effective. But, but I but, just wanted to hammer home. But that's the, why I love it is because it makes the point that, yeah, but this isn't a selfless advocacy. This isn't right. just how can I change the world right. in that, you know, 0.002% right. of the way that everything I could possibly do is going to, you know, it's going to have that little impact. And that can mean a lot, as you suggest. Yeah. It, but my point is, and I think you agree with this, in any given moment, you should know your purpose. What am right. I doing and why am I doing it? Right. And your end in that regard is that, is it that little tiny slice? Well, that matters, a little change of the world, or even a dozen people that I helped them on their journey. But it's really, it's got to be an end in itself. That's for yes. me, politics, the way that I engage in politics, and I engage in politics more than the average person, but it's got to be an end in itself. I'm not necessarily going to change anything. You know, even when it comes to changing minds, I'm mostly planting seeds. When was the last time you had a debate with somebody and they said, oh, that changed my mind on that? You know, it happens, oh, well. but, but it's rare. You plant the seeds. You put the ideas out there. And of course, you're also talking to the audience. But yeah, that argument, that discussion, that debate, that conversation needs to be an end in itself or you shouldn't be having it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I mean, speaking of effective altruism and... Um... I have, I've, we've actually witnessed, uh, you know, people who are Ayn Rand fans or call themselves objectivists are altruistic in terms of beleaguering and, and just beating themselves up about how they need to change the culture. And I mean, oh, they, yeah. they basically kind of descend into a sort of cynicism. Are they doing enough? Are they doing enough? And, and, and berating other people around them, other objectivists around them for not doing enough. Or, you know, or you must ally yourself with these other objectivist groups or, you know, not to get into that, but, you know, or, or, you know, you're not doing enough to, to spread the uh, cause of objectivism. And it's, I've seen that and uh, something yeah. to watch out for. Unearned even if it's, guilt. Yeah, unearned gr guilt. And um, uh, it's something to watch out for, you know, even if you're just, you know, playing around online and uh, uh, seeing somebody's wrong on the internet and trying to correct them. 
Um, and, and again, I mean, you, you have to understand when you're trying to convince somebody and you're trying to persuade somebody, it's best to know them first and talk to them in person. If you're online, you have no idea who they are. And, uh, and so, so, you know, the, when I engage on online, I'll just say this, when I engage online trying to be persuasive, I always start off my sentences with, you might consider, you know, this particular assertion, you, you might, uh, you might rethink what your, you know, what your argument is, you know, or, or your argument might be better if you, if you think in terms of, you know, in the, in this and so on. So, so I, I use kind of you know, the power of suggestion <laughs> with people. Yeah. Well, even who that's I don't a little know. more aggressive than just, oh yeah, that's what you think. Well, here's what I think. As opposed to you should think, but yeah. I'll tell you what, Allison is in with the super chat. Again, I should mention those of you who are super chatting, again, I said you're, you're supporting ARC UK. If you want to support them even more and get access to content like Don Watkins communication boot camps that the average man on the street doesn't have access to, you should be a member of ARC UK. Go to aynrandcenter.co.uk. Center spelled the British way with the R-E at the end. aynrandcenter.co.uk. Link will be in the chat there. Sign up. It's £5.99 a month. You know, granted, that's 7 or $8 US. Totally worth it. You'll get access to some of the material from Don that nobody else gets to see. Similarly, James Valiant does a Sunday morning workshop, only available to members. If you're coming to Ayn Rand Con, you'll have access to things that only members can do. So sign up and support the organization. But Allison says, and I kind of get this, she says, I disagree to a point. I know plenty of people that got into objectivism because of Mark's feed. Not everybody knows because not everybody is head over heels in love with Mark Pellegrino like some of us are. But I know plenty of people that got into objectivism because of Mark's feed. He's passionate about it. And that's his strong point. Well, there's I mean, maybe we can do a separate episode at some point because there's there's this complicated thing in persuasion. And I'll just name one aspect of it, which is there's kind of modeling um, like truth above all else and kind of the patient approach that Amy's talking about. But there's also kind of like modeling a sort of confident, inspirational sort of like he's battling for the, you know, his ideas. And certainly if you're trying to gain a wide public platform, um, the provocativeness and so on gets more attention. And so I, um, the way I, the way I think about it is that both approaches are totally legitimate and, and you should really kind of pick your approach based on your purpose and your personality. Um, they both have positives and negatives, but if you separate out sort of the persuasive side of it, and you're just focused on what you want to cultivate the mindset of I'm interested in what's true and I'm going to hold myself to high standards. However, you kind of you know, position yourself in a public disagreement. Um, that's what we're really talking about here. And I think Mark, um, I mean, part of why he's such a good uh, champion for the philosophy is that's the kind of guy he is, that he holds himself to high standards. And even though he'll go out there and battle and duel and, you know, be uh, provocative and everything at the end of the day, that's coming from somebody who takes ideas seriously and is really interested in what's get in getting it what's true. Um, and so that's, that's really the important thing. And then th the rest of it is more kind of persuasion, strategic sort of considerations. Yeah. And what I see in Mark that I don't see in other firebrands, you know, people who aren't quite as effective is when you watch Mark, you know what he's fighting for. Whereas people who fight in anger, you know, Mark can get angry, but you know what he's angry about. You know what is what he's actually fighting for, as opposed to people who are just angry because of the left or because of the right or because whatever it is they're angry about. Mark isn't just angry. He's passionate and he puts that to good use. I mean, it helps that he's incredibly good looking and all the women want to be with him and all the men want to be him, but, but he's got that passion. He's got the positivity. I don't mean positivity. I mean, he's got, he's fighting for something. Right. And sometimes I think as objectivists, you know, people throw the label objectionist at us. Occasionally, I, I think that's earned and uh, not Mark at all. So 
yeah, yeah, he's got he's got the passion. He's very good at what he does. And yeah, I certainly wouldn't say that. Yeah, nobody should be spending a lot of time and energy fighting philosophical battles. For some people, that's their 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 passion. That's their hobby. It's where they want to spend a third of their time when they're not working. And for some people, it's their profession. And it's where they want to spend 70% of their time, all the time that they're working. So I certainly didn't mean to bl- make a blanket statement that, uh, yeah, everybody should be at the beach and nobody should be fighting for ideas. So so back to your wonderful article. Oh, wait, on- I'm sorry to interrupt, but there was just one point I wanted to make along those lines. This is very small, but it's, so I don't think about like changing the world or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I think about changing my world and holding it in those personal terms and that's not alone enough to guarantee that you do everything the right way, but it helps you like, is this really, if, I, if I'm trying to change my world, then that helps make me prioritize. Like my world involves in part what the federal government is doing or what truckers in Canada are doing, but a lot more of my world involves how are my relationships with my friends and my work and my wife and my kid, like my world is going to help me keep my hierarchy of values in balance. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, you've got to have some connection and not just because you watch CNN or Fox News, but you've got to have some connection to what you're fighting for. <laughs> they actually have to be values in your life. Uh, thank you, Allison, for saying we are the best looking here. We know better, but we'll take it. <laughs> I will. I will take it. Thank you very much. <sighs> Yeah, Chandler had a very funny uh, comment uh, with regard to um, uh, mosquitoes and effective altruism. He said, you can kill mosquitoes with Atlas Shrugged. <laughs> you could, you could. If somebody won't listen to reason, you throw a copy of Atlas Shrugged at their head. That's that right. will be more penetrating. I've got, I've got to yeah. get to this question because yes, yes, we are do. well into the hour and we've covered a lot of great stuff already. But uh, there seems to be more of an angry, you're either for us or against us than ever attitude of, if you're not on my side, you're the enemy. And it's getting harder to tell who are the followers and who are the rebels. We did an episode called Blind Followers or Blind Rebels, obviously, to make the case that the blindness is the common denominator. In judging an individual or in judging a movement and and executing on that, you said you have an unfair advantage. And I think I've heard you use this phrase in the context of when you were working with Alex Epstein too. What is your unfair advantage? What is the unfair advantage that you've got? Well, I don't have it. I don't have it across the board. Part of what I was arguing in in the piece is that on an issue like climate, I do versus like, I, I give the example of like, is this guy in physics a crank or is he not? I don't, but like on climate, I mean, I have a philosophic framework and then I have a um, I, I have put in the time to really know the facts. So th- that's why I feel like I can part from the mainstream on that issue, even though I'm not a climate scientist, because I know why I'm parting with the mainstream and why I think I'm in a position to part with the mainstream. And so that's the kind of you know point I'm drawing there. And philosophy can is in a sense, you could say it's an across the board advantage or to put it more specifically, a good methodology is an across the board advantage, but um, it has to be applied and you don't have the time in your life to apply it to every single place. And so that's, that's why it can't be, well, I have a true philosophy, therefore, like I'm going to give myself a blank check to think that I'm in a position to, you know, adopt, um, That can't be a reason to think that my conclusions are necessarily more rational just because I have a rational philosophy. It's, right. it's, it's having a rational philosophy, really understanding it, and then doing the work to apply it to um, a given area. But yeah, I mean, there's plenty of places where like, I have no advantage at all. And I, you know, uh, in general, then don't have strong views there. Or if I have to take a certain kind of action, I'm going to defer to experts though not blindly and i mean that would take us longer than we have here but there's a whole art of how to rationally consult experts greg salmieri has an amazing talk on it um alex epstein's new book that will be out in a few months on fossil fuels our fossil future has a lot more to say 
about how to actually consult experts the right way. Um, and so, but yeah, I mean, that's sort of how I think about it is, um, the, no, yeah, I must admit, I still kind of hold on to the idea of, of philosophy as being an unfair advantage, but only in the sense that it, it doesn't give me authority over other people or give me the right answers. It just makes it much more obvious what more work I've got to do to find them and to know when my arguments aren't very strong. So that, that yeah, is but something. It, right. And so in a sense, it's an advantage across the board, but it's, I was specifically dealing with the question of like, when as an amateur Am I in a position to claim knowledge at odds with the best minds on the planet in a yeah. certain area? Right? right. And that I think there's a really high bar for. And the fact that I have philosophic knowledge is not by itself going to be um, a justification for doing that. There, there's a lot that goes into it. If it's an area you're a specialist in, then like, and you have a right philosophy, you know, then uh, like, the threshold for parting ways with conventional wisdom is actually pretty low because it's you're you are in effect the person who's supposed to be setting what conventional wisdom is in your field not kind of bowing and bowing isn't the right word but not sort of taking your lead from experts um so it's th those are kind of some of the like the context just are very different yeah in the context of climate too the the philosophical side of it seems and i think you mentioned this in your discussion in your essay is when you find that an expert is arguing not so much from the data, but simply from the perspective that, well, humans aren't important anyway, and they're not a priority, then at least at that point, you can say, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to argue the numbers with you. I'm just going to make the point that if your end game is an unsullied planet, no matter how miserable it makes people, then I don't need any more data because we're having different discussions at that point. Yeah. And even so, I mean, here's one area where like Alex and I, I don't put us in the same category. That is, he has much stronger views on the question of how much warming is there likely to be and what does the science say about that? Because he's put in the work and is in a position to know. I don't, I, I when I argue in my own thinking I'm much more um, I'll much more follow the line and I'm going to forget his name. Anyway, he's um, where I'll in effect take as the IPCC report of like what's been established and what's not, not the, not the report that goes into the, for policymakers, which is all political politicized, but like take more or less given what's in the kind of full report and say, okay, given that I still think we should be using more fossil fuels, not less. Whereas Alex's will be more critical of even kind of what the IPCC consensus is on those issues. Cause he, I mean, he works with, you know, experts and has devoted a lot of time to it. So, but that's what I mean. Like, even though I worked at CIP and even though like I spent a lot of time, I still don't think I'm in a position to take strong views on those scientific questions um, that are at odds with what the kind of uh, core, you know, the leading scientists think on it. And uh, I think Alex is probably right in the sense of, I know he's put in the work and he makes a really reasonable case, but I don't put myself in that same category for that reason. So that might be helpful for people to see that like, there's, there's a, like a, there's a lot of gradations on any given issue in terms of like, what am I in a position to know? And, and you know, everything between full expertise and nothing at all. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of gradients in between those two. Yeah. And, and I really like what you said in the article with regard to judging whether or not somebody is an expert and whether or not you can trust their, uh, their, 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 if they have a solid epistemological framework and methodology. Um, there, there's actually a quote by uh, somebody, somebody else you put in your article who said, look for strong analytical abilities. And if you don't see it, run the other way. I really appreciated that. And um, yeah, but but for somebody like Alex Epstein, you know, like you were saying, he does a lot of the work. He understands a lot of the de detail. He digs deep into those subjects. So you can pretty much, you know, I would say pretty much objectively say he's a good source, <laughs> to say the least. 
Yeah, in particular, what the way that he positions himself, which is right. He's an energy expert and he's a guide to the other experts and so-called experts. In other words, he's kind of taking your hand as a philosopher and saying, how should you process these various claims? Um, and so it's a really helpful orienting lead to now, if I really want to understand this debate at a deep level, he's given me the tools to kind of look at what the experts and uh, are saying and who to take as a real expert and so on. Um, but, uh, and again, there's a big difference between what are my views as a private citizen and who I'm going to vote for versus like I'm Don Watkins doing work as a public intellectual. What am I going to, you know, publicly advocate for? So, um, you know, you, you have a much higher threshold when you're going to be a kind of public champion of a set of ideas um, the kind of level of work you have to put in is just so much greater than, Hey, I just need to know how to vote. And like, like what should my general kind of policy view here be? Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Well, as we get to war, there's a couple things I've got to ask before we get to the end of the hour. All right, I'll try to keep my answer short. And no, that's all right. Cause these are completely off topic. Because I, I think we've made a great point and people need to read your article. Again, it's in the show notes with links to other related articles. You had a great discussion with James Valiant about chapters three and four from Philosophy Who Needs It, uh, where she spoke about the missing link and then the, uh, the lone wolves. What was selfishness without a self? Those links are in the show notes. Folks need to give those a listen. But it's, there's also that ARI discussion about expertise. But I want to jump way ahead because I think we've given people a real handle on when to know they're doing the right thing and when to question, am I, uh, well, I, I won't try objective. to recap the whole discussion. <laughs> yeah. am, I, am I being objective? Am I, uh, am I doing this right? How's the new nonfiction book coming? I mean, really well, like it's the, uh, I've gotten a bunch of feedback in the draft. Um, I'm going to be getting a lot more feedback. Um, I don't have a good timeline because uh, in part, it depends on, um, th there's a number of philosophers who are going to get back to me, but I, like, I don't know exactly when that'll be. And then it, it depends on how long it'll take to revise. But, um, I promised by the end of spring that will probably get pushed into the summer at, at least. Uh, but this year I'm pretty confident, uh, it'll come out, but no, I'm really, I'm really happy with, um, the, kind of general approach and a lot of the content, but uh, now it's about like taking that, you know, broadly shaped in marble and really fine tuning it into a sculpture. It's exciting to know that you've got some high minds working on this because it's not that I question your writing, but just, I think this is going to be so important that uh, that's very exciting to me to hear that now, if it's got to be delayed, it's because I'm waiting for some really sharp people to get back to me. That is good to hear. And finally, wait, wait before you go, what, oh, was yeah. the, what was the name of that book again, Don? Uh, Self-Made Manifesto. Thank you. Yes. And finally, how are the sales and reviews for I Am Justice, the fiction book, since we've been talking nonfiction for the last hour? Have there been any surprises along the way? Having published I mean, the reviews... your first novel. The reviews have been incredible. I mean, we have like more than a hundred, most of them five stars. And if you read them, like people really, really like it. The sales have not been great. Like the it's so hard to sell a first novel. And like I haven't really done media or anything like that. And I mean, it's one of the challenges of not having a major publisher. Major publishers often don't help you do a lot of promotion, but they can and and sometimes do. Um, and so it's the the marketing experts that I've talked to in the you know like past month or two. I mean, basically their view is that um, there's really no substitute for pumping out a lot of books in a series and then using price promotions and advertising in order to drive sales to the first one, which then leads sales to the later one. So it's mostly going to be a, a long game, um, but uh, for me, the important part is that. I'm really proud of the book and the people who've read it have really liked it. But so far, all indications are I won't be able to retire on it anytime soon. Well, Guillaume in the chat says, is there going to be a sequel to your fiction book? I loved 
I am justice. Now, I think I already know the answer to that. We kind of alluded to it. You've pretty much got it written at this point, right? Well, I have a draft, a draft. Um, but we'll see, you know, what it takes to get it to a fan. I mean, I really like the draft, but there's a lot of hard work to do on it. And unfortunately, like that just has to take go in the back burner until I wrap up self-made manifesto and um, some other kind of exciting work announcements I'll be making public in a few weeks. So there it, it, it is not forgotten, but um, I was hopeful I was going to get it out this year as well probably not going to happen so i'm hopefully i'm i'm hoping next year gian says take my money <laughs> outstanding well this has been a great hour i especially appreciate talking about that essay again links to it are in both the announcements and the show notes anybody who hasn't read it yet needs to go through it i must admit i haven't read everything on your writing website and i'm i'm working my way backwards because it's so good. If, if anybody's not yet aware of donswriting.medium.com, there, there's an unassuming name for a website, donswriting.medium.com. You think, oh, it's a guy who's put months of his writing up. This, this is so good. And uh, yeah, and you also have an email list. So how can they get on your email list? Yeah, I mean, that's the best way to stay in contact is to go to donswriting.com and, uh, you know, all one word. And sign up for the email list. They'll get like this series on persuasion and email series for free that I think is really good. And um, I used to publish the newsletter every week, but uh, right now it's at every month just to accommodate everything else that I'm doing. But part of what it'll do is make sure you don't miss any of the stuff I am doing because it is taking place, you know, on Medium, in books, on ARC TV, so or ARC UK. So, uh, it's kind of like the one-stop shop to make sure that you get everything that I'm doing. This is what being a professional intellectual looks like in 2022. And since the link to Don's writing is in the chat, I should mention one more time, aynrandcenter.co.uk to support the Ayn Rand Center UK. We'll be there next week. We'll be there in person in a week and a half. Oh, oh my gosh, looking forward to that. <laughs> Don, you're going to be in London too, aren't you? Uh, I will not. I'm actually going to be in Florida. Oh, okay. oh, well, okay. I guess we'll have to catch you on Zoom then over the long distances. If anybody wants to keep track of what Amy and I are up to, robertnacer.com. Yep. Everything you need to know about me is there. It's a plain page, not a whole lot of stuff, which makes it real easy to find my Facebook and Twitter and all that good stuff. Don, this has been a great hour and we're not quite done yet. We're going to jump over to Clubhouse. So anybody who's available to come chat, if you had a question that you asked in the chat, but didn't throw money on it, that's okay. You can come up on the Clubhouse stage, talk to us then. Don, thank you. And uh, we will talk to you in a bit. We'll talk to everybody else. Uh, TBA, what's going to happen with the schedule over the course of, uh, is it a, a week, weeks. week and a half from today? Yeah. And uh, it's going to be exciting. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. We will see you on Clubhouse. Thank you, Don, and everybody have an outstanding St. Patrick's Day. Go out and get lucky. Thanks, Don. Thanks, everybody. My pleasure.